Welcome everyone to October's SHRS Innovation Seminar. Um, so this month, um, we'll have Kevin Trout here talking with us about the secret to selling with hospitals. So Kevin is an experienced entrepreneur, business owner, and sales professional with over 35 years of experience in the medical device industry. Kevin was the founder and president of Grandview Medical Resources, Inc. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, this company was a specialty medical equipment distributor with an average annual growth rate of 23% per year before selling this company in 2011. Um, by the time he retired in 2016, Kevin's company was conducting business with approximately 90% of the hospitals in uh, his market. So that market was the Western PA and West Virginia area, and it included a 10-year contract with UPMC Health Systems. So lots of great information to come today in this chat. Uh, so looking forward to hearing from you, Kevin, and take it away whenever you're ready. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me. So welcome to the session on the secret to selling the hospitals. I'm gonna give you the secret right up front. It's understanding the hospital's buying process because the hospital's buying process trumps your sales process 100% of the time. It's complex and you gotta learn the rules of the game. If you don't play by the rules, you run the risk of getting banned from the hospitals, possibly for life, no matter how good your technology is. So we're gonna talk about how to navigate the hospital buying process. These are the things we're gonna talk about today. Who are the decision makers? Who are the key influencers? And who are the decision processors? How do they work together? What's a value analysis committee? How do they function? Nursing education, some of my favorite people. These people know a secret that you need to know. We're gonna talk a little bit about the options when it comes to distribution channels. We're also going to touch on healthcare industry trade shows and how valuable they are. I'm going to share my personal favorite with you. We're going to touch on GPOs, which are group purchasing organizations. If you're familiar with them, you know what they do. If you're not familiar with them, well, they play a, a role in contracting as well as they may be able to influence the fact that you can't even walk in the hospital to make a sales call. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about pricing strategies, not because I want to tell you how to price your product, but because I wanna make you aware of a trap that you can fall into if you're not aware of it. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about leveraging your successes and then how to connect with the right people. I'm sharing my personal experience in the 34 years I was in medical sales. So this is not all encompassing, but at least I'm gonna create a framework that you can work from as you begin to pursue sales in hospitals. Are you ready? Let's talk about key decision makers, key influencers, and decision processors. The key decision makers in hospitals today are the value analysis committees. They're also known as product evaluation committees. Yeah, they have some subcommittees that are part of them. Like I dealt with the bariatric committee. I dealt with the safety committee. But I also dealt with the main value analysis committees as well. These are the people who look at all new medical technology. They hold the keys to the kingdom, OK? And it's a process to work with them. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that process looks like. Who are the key influencers? Well, they're the individual nursing units. When the value analysis committee gives your product to go ahead, usually goes to an evaluation. There's usually a nursing unit or two or three that get, get identified to be the ones to evaluate your product. Those individual nursing units are gonna fill out a survey. They're gonna give you the, the committee they're gonna give them their feedback. What's the pros, what's the cons? What are the likes, what are the dislikes? Do we recommend using it? Do we recommend adopting it or not? All of that gets fed back up to the value analysis committee. So they do play a key role in influencing those decisions that are made. Also nursing specialists. I typically work with the wound care nurses and infection control nurses. There's a lot of other ones as well. Physicians are a key influencer. Now you're probably saying, hey, wait a minute. I thought physicians had some say-so on what products they get to use. Yeah, 20 years ago they did. Those were physician preference items. But what's happened in today's market space is supply chain management has literally corralled physicians' preference items so that there's not very many of them. What happens now is many of the physicians' practices are owned by the hospitals. So when 
supply chain contracts with vendors, they tell the physicians which, con which vendors are contracted with and what products they can use. If the physician finds a product that they like and they want to have the hospital evaluate so that they can use it, they have to run it through the value analysis committee. So they, will, they can present it to them and ask them to run it through the process. But the physicians typically don't have the power to buy on their own anymore. So that's why I call them key influencers. Decision processors. These are the people who process other people's decisions, mainly the VAC committees. Purchasing agents, supply chain management, materials managers. So here's the deal with purchasing agents. And, and I respect the job they have to do. My key thing is don't try to make a sales call to a purchasing agent. Don't try to sell them on your product or your technology. You're going to meet with purchasing at the beginning of this whole process, and you're going to meet with them at the end of the whole process. But the process in the middle is when the, the uh, value analysis committee does their work. So in the beginning, you want to drop off the information to the purchasing agent, simply three things. Here's our product. Here's our price. Here's how to order it. That's all you need to give them. And just let them know. I want to make you aware of what we have and what we do in case any of your clinicians want to take a look at it. And if they do, we'll make you aware. Now, when the value analysis committee goes through their whole process and they decide that your product is a go, yes, we want it. We're going to bring it in. We're going to make it standard of care. Then they send you back down to purchasing. And now that purchasing agent's job is to negotiate a contract with you or in essence, the lowest possible price they can get from you, okay? And, and if there's any purchasing agents on this call, all due respect, I appreciate the job you have to do, okay? So let's talk about the key decision makers. These are the value analysis committees. These are made up of individual nursing unit managers, some spe specialty clinical managers. There's always somebody from purchasing, whether it's the purchasing agent or the buyer from the purchasing department, because the clinicians are representing the clinical efficacy. We're looking at the clinical efficacy of your product technology, and the purchasing people are handling the money, meaning they have to, they have to represent the interests of the financial people, okay? And really, the whole idea of the committees is to evaluate the clinical efficacy and financial improvements that can be gained with the new technology. It is a long drawn out process. How they work. Hospitals, these value analysis committees typically meet once a month and they have an agenda of new technology that they wanna talk about during that meeting that month. They don't always get to the whole list of especially products. So you might get bumped to the following month. So it might be months before you actually get brought up. Most of the value analysis committees will bring the vendor in to do your dog and pony show. So don't be surprised if there's a line of vendors outside the committee meeting room door waiting to do their 15 minutes of fame. When you do your presentation, you're gonna be educating the clinical managers on your product and what it does. One of the things that we did in my company that I think made us stand out was we would find out who the members of the committee were before our product came up on the agenda to be discussed. And we would try to meet with as many of those members as possible to do an interview, not to make a, not to make a sales call, but to interview them, to ask them questions. How are you managing the patients right now that our product can service? Tell me more about that. What are the biggest challenges? What are the things you'd like to see different? What would you like your hospital to provide to you that might improve quality of care or make the nurses' jobs easier? Again, we don't sell them, we gather that information. So when we would go in and do our 15 minute product presentation, two things happen. One, we're a known entity because we've already met with these people. So they know us already. The second thing is 80% of our presentation was simply based on the feedback during the interview that they gave us. Well, Ann said this, this is what she was looking for. This is how we do this. Paula said this, this is what we do to address that. 20% of our presentation was actually about the product. It was more about the outcomes that they can expect to derive based on the challenges they share with us. That's a totally different presentation than a lot of other sales reps would make, which is mostly a PowerPoint presentation about their product, you know, you know, basically specs. So we did it a little bit differently and it worked very well for us. So let's talk a little bit about the purpose of value analysis committees. So 
I like these two quotes because the first one is really, really simple, right? Value analysis is not about finding just the right or the cheapest price, which should balance reducing costs and improving quality. It's very straightforward, right? The second one I like a little bit better because I think it's more encompassing. The goal of value analysis is to work as a multidisciplinary team, which is why you have all the clinicians and purchasing on the same value analysis committee, making product decisions based on a holistic, educated, and um, understanding of how a given product will impact patient care, financials, and the facility's strategic goals. I think that's a really great definition. All right, here's the one that makes me cringe. <laughs> the focus of a true value analysis should be to determine the clinically acceptable products, not clinically superior, clinically acceptable, and uh, from there, create a competitive contracting environment that will result in the best economic opportunity for the facilities. What they're saying is you don't have to be clinically superior, just have to be clinically acceptable. And we're gonna find out who all of your competitors are. We're gonna get pricing from every one of them. And then we're gonna leverage their pricing against you. Be prepared for that because that's how some hospitals work. Not all of them, but some more than you would like. All right, so that's, nurse, that's uh, value analysis committees. They are the decision makers and their process can take months. The days, the old days of walking in 20 years ago, you could go in, meet with a unit manager, make a, make a, a sales call. You'd walk out with an order because they had the ability to make that decision. Can't do that anymore. The days of the one call close, the mythical one call close are over. So let's talk about nursing education, switch gears a little bit here. Why, why do I like these people? I really respect nursing education. I respect all nurses in general. If there's any nurses on this call, you should raise your hand and be recognized because I gotta tell you, you are my heroes, okay? You have the toughest job and your commitment and your compassion is off the charts. And I really, really respect the job that you do. But nursing education in particular, these are the people that when the value analysis committee or VAC for short, when the VAC committee says, hey, we found a product, we wanna go forward, we wanna do a trial evaluation. They contact nursing education and nursing education will set up all the, uh, they'll coordinate all the product training, what we call in-servicing for your product during that evaluation. Here's the secret. They know everyone who's on the committee. They know all of the VAC committee, the chairperson and most of the members. So here's my point. If you go to purchasing and you ask, hey, who's on your product evaluation committee or your VAC committee? They typically won't tell you. What they'll say is, oh, that's confidential. I can't share that with you. However, if you go to nursing education and you let them know, hey, we've got a product that's on the agenda. I don't know which month it's going to come up um, or when. So the, the, the thing is, we would like to just share some information with the committee members and really want to learn from them a little bit about what they're doing right now to make sure that when we do our presentation, it's, it's impactful and meaningful to them. I would tell you that nine times out of 10 that I have asked that question, the nursing education manager provides the committee members and their email addresses for me. So it's just a way of making sure that you get to know who's on the committee, who's gonna be making a decision for you. All right. Switching gears. Let's do a little bit about distribution channels. If you're a startup, or even in the first phases of scaling up, I can tell you a direct sales force is a pretty expensive way to go. And these are the people that are W-2 employees. You have 100% of their time and attention. Um, many companies don't start with a direct sales force when they're in their scale up mode or startup mode. Typically go through distributors or independent sales reps. With regards to distributors, there's a couple of trade associations. IMDA, which is the Independent Medical Distributors Association of North America. These are the specialty distributors. These are the people that bring new complex technology to hospitals. They have a history of over the past, I don't know, 60, 70 years of launching new medical technology that today is now standard of care in most hospitals across the country. Um, I was a member of IMDA myself as an independent distributor and I served as a president back in uh, 2010 and 2011. It's a great organization. What they bring to the table is the established relationships that they already have 
with supply chain and with clinicians in the hospitals in our given geography, right? So when you, when you get them to distribute your product, they're going to bring your product in and they're already typically selling other products to those same hospitals and they'll be able to bring yours in. It's a whole lot easier. The other trade association is HIDA, which is the Health Industries Distributors Association. These are more the box movers. These are more like uh, tongue depressors and adult diapers and bedpans, high volume, low margin um, stocking distributors, right? Then there's the independent sales reps. These are the straight commission 1099 reps. Their trade association is HIRA, Health Industries Representatives Association. The difference between HIRA and HIDA, HIDA stocks, stocks your product, they're gonna pay your wholesale price. They're going to sell the product to the hospital. They'll build a hospital and um, they'll collect payment from the hospital. Independent sales reps, they'll generate an order for your product. They'll send the order to you. You as a manufacturer will ship the order. You'll build a hospital. You'll collect payment from the hospital and then you'll turn around and cut a commission, rep, a commission check to the sales reps. So it's just a different ways. Um, typically the 1099 independent sales reps are carrying five or six or seven product lines, but they too have an established relationship already existing with the people that make the buying decisions and process the buying decisions in the hospitals. Okay, let's talk. Let's touch on healthcare industry trade shows. These are important. There's specialty trade shows, both national and local chapters for just about every nursing specialty or even physician specialty, okay? There's a American Association of Orthopedic Nurses. There's a National Association of Rehab Nurses. There's the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. There's a national trade show for all these people somewhere around the country every year. But then they also have local chapters where a local chapter of the Critical Care Nurses Association will have their own mini uh, uh, trade show here locally in between the annual one for the national, okay? And whatever product or whatever uh, specialty area of care that your product fits into, you're gonna wanna look into what's the trade show or what's, uh, what is the uh, trade association and where's the local chapters. Now get into my favorite ones, okay? The American Organization of Le Nursing Leadership. These are the chief nursing officers, the vice presidents of nursing. They are, these are the top clinicians in any organization. And their national organization is the AONL. But here's my favorite. This is the Southwestern PA Organization of Nurse Leaders, affectionately referred to as SWAPONAL. These are the people that are the chief nursing officers. They're key main lieutenants. And it draws from Eastern Ohio, uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania, Northern West Virginia. This uh, trade show is always at uh, the last three days of August, right before um, Labor Day. It's the last three, it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right before Labor Day weekend. It's always at Nemecolon, and it is well worth attending. We had great success going to Swiponal every single year because we would see the chief nursing officers in the hospitals we were doing business with, and we had a very great relationship with them, but they also would bring over the chief nursing officers from the hospitals that we were not doing business with. And it's a very relaxed setting. People are much friendlier. You got them outside of their hospital setting. So they're, they're more open and they're willing to, to listen and learn. And we picked up a lot of new hospitals through this Waponal um, organization meeting every year. It, it, it's, it's very, very well attended. Now your, your accountant or your controller is probably going to balk at the price um, as in we can't afford this. Well, I can tell you that it may be a little pricey, but it's definitely a worthwhile investment. Um, we, we gain great ground in our ability to get into hospitals because if we met the chief nursing officer, they would normally say, ah, I know the person in my organization I want you to go meet with. So we would contact that person and say, hey, your chief nursing officer asked us to reach out to you. We would always get an appointment that way, almost without fail. So it's one of the little tricks that work really well. Oh boy, we're purchasing organizations. I don't know how many people understand how the group purchasing organizations work, but it's important that we touch on it. GPOs typically have, I don't know, 800 or so hospitals belong as members. There's 6,000 hospitals in the United States. 
So there's a handful of GPOs and their goal is to negotiate contracts with vendors at deep discounts. Here's the thing, it's a double-edged sword. Hospitals often belong to two or more GPOs. So you might have a contract with one GPO and say, oh, I'm sorry, we buy from the company that's contracted on the other GPO. They're non-exclusive contracts. Their selling point is, hey, if you, uh, if you work with us as a GPO, we can give you access to our 800 member hospitals. Well, that's all well and good, but there's no guarantee they're gonna buy from you because it's sort of, hey, it'll get you in the front door. You can now claim to be a GPO contracted vendor, but that doesn't mean they're required to buy from you. You still have to go through the whole selling process, through the whole value analysis committee uh, uh, journey that, that they have in place. You still may not get chosen. Because what the GPOs typically do is if they give you a contract, they're going to find out who your competitors are. They're going to go negotiate with contracts with your competitors as well. So in my, in my experience, we, there was five companies that did what we did. Okay. And all five of them had the GPO contract with almost every one of these. So Premier is a big one. There's UHS, Vizient. That's the old med assets along with another one. I forget health trust. Um, I can tell you health trust is the toughest. If you walk into a health trust hospital, the sales rep, their first question at the door is, are you a, a health trust contracted vendor? If your answer is no, they escort you out the front door. You can't go any further. Um, really tough to deal with. Fortunately, that it's not a huge number of hospitals, but they're pretty, in the South particularly, there's a lot of them. So VA health system, right? They have their own GPO. If you wanna get a VA contract, I would highly encourage you to work with an, organ an outside organization that specializes in getting VA uh, hospital uh, uh, contracts because it's very complex. If you've never done it before, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. So anyway, the, the whole purpose of the GPOs is to leverage buying power. Expect to discount roughly 30% or you know, give or take for a GPO contract. Here's the tricky part. This is the tricky part. If you go into a hospital the first time and you talk to purchasing, their first question is, well, you, are you on our GPO contract? If you don't have a contract, say no. They go, oh, sorry. If, you don't have a G, if you're not on our GPO contract, I can't let you talk to any of our clinicians. Okay, so then you go to the GPO and say, hey, we need to get a contract with you so that we can go into your member hospitals and, and sell to them. And the GPO says, well, which one of our hospitals is interested in your product? And your answer is, well, none of them yet because we haven't been allowed to. Well, the GPO says, why would we negotiate a contract with you if none of our members are interested? Come back when somebody is. It's one of these. It's a stalling tactic. There's two ways around it. Number one, you can tell them, hey, our product is unique. There is nothing like it on the market. So therefore, we don't compete with any of your GPO contracts. That'll get you past uh, some of the, the, the stalling tactics. Maybe you do have competitors. So you can say, hey, we actually are in the, looking forward to getting a GPO contract some point in the future. We intend to work on that. But we know how they work. In order for us to get a GPO contract, we have to have some of their member hospitals interested in the product, which is why we're here. So we would like you, your hospital, to be one of the member hospitals to take a first look at what we offer. And if it works well and you like it, then we would ask for your support when we go to the GPO to ask for the contract. If you have that type of dialogue, the purchasing agent is going to know that you understand how to play the game. All right. Let's talk about pricing strategies. I'm not gonna tell you how to price your product, but I am gonna give you an example so that you can be aware of the trap that you might fall into. Let's say, for example, you need a gross profit margin of 40%. That's pretty typical actually, because 40% enables you to make your payroll. It enables you to make, uh, you know, your over, cover your overhead. If you're really good, you maybe only need 35%, so that extra 5% can be reinvestment dollars that you put back into your growth. So if you were to price your product with the cost of goods and a 40% margin, my example is cost of goods is 
$40 for the gross margin, your minimum price is $100. You're going to have to raise that price because you will be pressured to lower your prices. You will, it's going to be demanded. GPOs are going to ask for a 30% discount. Regional purchasing coalitions, which are subgroups of GPOs, they're going to want another 5 to 10% to actually act as champions or sponsors for your product in the hospitals, members that may not be taking advantage of your GPO contract. Supply chain management and IDN contract administrators are going to ask for more of a discount. Here's the latest thing that they have started saying, and it happened, I don't know, six years ago. Suddenly we were hearing it from every hospital. They were saying, oh, you, you have our GPO contract, that's great. However, the pricing that you have on a GPO contract is just our starting point for negotiating. What? <laughs> we had to go back to the GPO and say, this is what we're hearing from multiple hospitals. And they say, yeah, this is what they're doing today. So you're gonna get a lot of pressure to lower your price. Your margins are gonna erode. erode. There's a lot of companies out there that did not position themselves price-wise in, in a way that as they began to accept these price concessions that were demanded of them, they went too far and they ended up going out of business. You need a 40% gross margin after everything is said and done just to keep your doors open and stay in business. So think about what your numbers are. Your controller, or CFO can figure that out. I'm just throwing out an example, but just the trap is know that you will have price concessions demanded of you. And then there's this thing called vendor credentialing, which is really expensive. And it is a fee that you have to pay for each one of your sales reps to walk into every one of the hospitals that you have them calling on. That's a whole nother subject for another day. Okay. Kevin, really quickly before you jump to that, there was a couple questions just about GPOs and just understanding how GPOs make money, if possible, really fast. Um, it's a question, are hospital systems generally part of GPOs or are individual hospitals? They, are, they all belong to GPOs. Every single hospital or health system will belong to one or more GPOs. So UPMC, they, they have... Uh, Med Assets and I think and Premier, I think Med Assets is now Vizient. Um, West Penn and that's Allegheny Health Network. Yes, they have their GPO as well. Um, yeah, you, you're you'll be hard pressed. I don't believe there's a single hospital in America that doesn't belong to at least one, if not two or more GPOs. And how Isn't does that? and how do the GPOs make money from the hospital? Um, the members have to pay a membership fee. So every hospital or health system has to pay a certain amount to the, the as, as members. And they take like a two or 3% of the volume of sales between their contracted vendors to the hospital members. And, the, and they take that as their fee. So they sort of skim off two or 3%. They're actually, I think 3% is by law, the maximum they're allowed to charge. There's literally a law about that. Did that answer that question? I'll let, I'll let Victor say that in the chat. And I appreciate Dan was also asking about the, how they make money. So thank you for addressing that really quickly. Sure, no problem. Um, leveraging your successes. All right. Cold calling is for rookies and masochists. I, I, I think that would be a great title for my book. Cold calling. You know what? 20 years ago, cold calling was the way you made sales. And the old sales managers back in those days would tell you, if you want to make more sales, you got to make more cold calls. Unfortunately, in today's market, a lot fewer people accept cold calls. You're going to have a much tougher time getting through. I think Sandler Sales Training has done a, a few um, surveys to find out that in the what I call the good old days, if you were really good at cold calling, you would get, th you would get through 30% of the time and strike out 70% of the time. But really, um, today, it's probably less than 10% that you're going to get through on cold calling. So you're going to make a whole lot of cold calls for very few results. Referrals are the lifeblood of this industry. And I want to talk more about that. But before I do, you know, if, you're, if your sales process is to put a really swanky website up and hope people find it, no, that's not going to happen. In fact, um, most of the clinicians are told to not go shopping on websites. 
websites are just your electronic version of your spec sheet that the value analysis committee will look at after you've done your presentation because they get more information about you from that. But that's only after you've been they've been introduced to you. It's all a relationship game. So you, you do need a website. You do need a really good website and it's got to be informative, but don't expect to put a website up and just have people come and flock to it. It isn't going to happen. So my 34 years of experience, I know this is still the way it is today. Referrals are the lifeblood of this industry. Every clinical manager knows most of their peers in other hospitals. I learned this lesson from West Penn Hospital and Mercy Hospital, the two burn units. West Penn burn unit began using my airbed. Then she told, the unit manager told me to call her friend who was a unit manager of Mercy's burn unit. I got in there because I was referred into. And after they, um, the Mercy burn unit started ordering from me, she ultimately said, you know, you never would have got to me if it hadn't been for my good friend over at West Penn. And I said, yeah, I know. I learned that lesson in 1985. I haven't made a cold call since 1985. I've been leveraging the referral method ever since. This is really important. There's an art to asking for referral. Start with your happiest customer. You only need one, one happy customer. Ask them, hey, if we had a... a very successful working relationship? Yes. Great. Um, who would you like me to share that success story with? Or um, who do you think would want to know about the success that we've um, enjoyed together? It's a very tactful question. When I ask that question, I usually get one or two referrals. And so then I would contact those people. Be careful how you ask, because if you say, hey, got any referrals for me? That's a yes or no question. And it's a little off-putting. If you say, I need to build my book of business, you got anybody else I can talk to? Again, that's about me, right? Make it about them. It's their success in working with you. you know, they've had great success working with your product. Hey, who else should know about this? Who do you think should know about this? Easiest question to ask. I'll tell you 90% of the salespeople don't ask for a referral, and so they get locked out. Referral calls have a 70% acceptance rate. That is my connection rate. I, as a sales professional, I track my connection rate as well as my closing rate, right? And I get a 70% acceptance rate by getting referrals. And I also have about a 90, 85 to 90% closing rate. I don't close everybody, uh, but I close most people. I think the bottom line here is if you, if you do the referral method correctly, you will enjoy the same success I had at my Granby Medical because the very first rule I gave every sales rep that I hired to rule number one, you're not allowed to cold call. It's a complete waste of time. I'm going to take you around to our uh, happiest customers, I'm going to introduce you. We're going to find out who else they think ought to know about what we're doing with them. And we would come away with referrals and we would contact those people. In other words, this is my favorite saying it's better to be a somebody that somebody sends than a nobody that nobody knows. How to connect with the right people. I got to tell you that in the last 20 years, we've tried many different emails to try to get an appointment. And that's the hardest part is getting that first time appointment with a prospect. And I found this email to be extremely effective. Okay, just a real quick uh, overview. In the subject line, I put the referral source's name. Why? Because I want them to open email. I want them to read my email. Right? If I put new technology, life-saving technology, or whatever my product name is, you're competing against a delete button because they're inundated with those types of emails. So put the referral source's name in the subject line. Then I just put, hello, so-and-so. I was referred to you by your friend, referral source's name. Hey, we were recently discussing the success we had working together, and your name came up during the conversation. Your friend suggests that this could be something you might be interested in. By working together, we were able to we were able to, and then I described one or two positive outcomes without mentioning your pro my product. I want, to, I want to give you an example. I would put in here, we were able to help them manage their most difficult to manage patients, comply with joint commission standards, and reduce workers' comp injuries by more than 50%. Now, that was what I would put in there, but you notice I never mentioned what the product was. It happened to be our bariatric equipment and the equipment we use to mobilize patients that were between 350 and 1,000 pounds. 
Another one I used was we help reduce accidental patient falls by 50 to 70 percent. We help you reduce your legal liability claims. An accidental patient fall is the third most frequent lawsuits against hospitals. But again, I never mentioned the product. The product happened to be portable fall prevention monitors. The next line is, I don't know if this is right for you or not. Hey, that says we're going to discover together, right? I'm not expecting you to buy from me if it's not right for you. And then I just say, I'd like to give you a call this Friday. Or sometimes I'll send a calendar invite to set up a brief call. Here's the key. I'd like to ask you some questions. Yeah, I'm inquisitive. I'm curious. I'll share some information. And after that, I'll leave it completely up to you to decide if it makes sense to explore any further. I am giving them permission to say no. And I'm okay with that. When I send this email out, I would get a 70% response rate. 70% of the people I sent this to, I would get an email back saying, I look forward to your phone call. So when you're referred, you're part of their inner club. The hardest part is getting connected to the people that you want to talk to. Whether they buy from you or not is their decision. That's going to come later during the sales process. But getting connected up front is the hardest part. This has worked for me. And every time I try to tweak this email, my uh, success rate goes down. So when I see people writing an email, an introductory email, with all their product specifications and all of this and that, it's like, okay, they're not going to read it. Okay. This one gets their attention and I am able to make the connection. I just want an appointment. We'll figure out if it's right for them to buy from me or not later, but you can't get anybody to buy from you if you can't get in front of them. All right. Is there some questions in the chat box? Uh, yes, it looks like there's one question on how, um, advising VAC on design of trail of your product. So can you advise that? Now I advise uh, back on design, design of trial of, yes, actually, the way I did it was um, I would typically give them an option. I would say, hey, what's your, what is your evaluation process? Many of our hospital customers, it's either two weeks or a month. Which one? Do you prefer? They usually have a standard one. And it's typically not more than 30 days. I'm okay with two weeks. I was okay with 30 days, whatever their process was. However, I wanted to control it to make sure that it was on specific nursing units, not all over the hospital, because you can't manage that. So I would try to steer them towards two, maybe four nursing units at the most. The two or three was sort of ideal because you have to do a lot of training on the product when it's first introduced. You have to follow up almost every day during the evaluation, at least in the first week. And you want to make sure the nurses are happy with the product because if there's a problem with your product, it's going to manifest itself in the first day or two. And you want to be able to be on, the, on, uh, on site in order to make sure that that gets resolved because usually, or not always, but sometimes it's user error. But well, anyway, yeah, so you can work with them on how you would like to see it done and also meld in how they like to normally do it. And it's usually very reasonable. Um, they're, they're very reasonable. If they decide they want to go forward, they usually would ask me, what's your trial evaluation protocol? Oh, thanks for asking. I appreciate that. You know, this is typically what we do. And they go, oh, okay, we can, we can do that. Did that answer the question? That was a long answer. Sorry. Kevin, I had a follow-up question to that. During these quality improvement studies, are you providing the product at no cost to them? Well, there's, uh, you can do it either way. It depends on what the hospital protocol is. And there's a little bit of a trap, right? So let me, let me answer it this way. Some hospitals will pay some discounted rate for an evaluation product. Um, some hospitals want it for free, like Cleveland Clinic wants your product for free for a whole year. So you want to stay away from them in the beginning. Um, they're just, they're out there. The, the, uh, the problem with giving them the product for free is they don't always value the free product. And as a result, it might sit in the corner in the nursing and it's supposed to be evaluating it and they don't pay a lot of, of attention to it. So it's gotta be something, either pay, pay a portion of the price so that they're committed or you're going to have to work very closely with the nursing unit to make sure they're committed if the product is for free. So it's kind of, it's not a black and white situation. It's whatever you can make happen, if that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. 
And another question that came up were, um, what are the main purchasing decisions that nursing is involved with as compared to medical professionals or physicians? Um, well, well, I can answer that by saying, what are the top five issues for hospitals and the value analysis committee? Um, one is treating bed sores. Number two is preventing accidental falls, not in this order. A third one is reducing workers' comp injuries among healthcare workers, because workers' comp injuries among nursing staff is 1.6 times higher than the next worst industry, which is construction. That's a really big one. Um, I think medication administration, you know, wrong administration of the right medication and um, or administering the wrong medication, I think that's one of them. So those were the ones that I heard of. Um, physicians, you know what, I'm not sure I can answer that directly because we didn't really sell to the doctors that much. Their main thing, I would believe, is in talking to the physicians that we did have a good relationship with, you know, they, they want quality patient outcomes. They want to make sure that um, they're doing everything they can to get that positive patient outcome. I think, really, if you can do three things, you're going to win over the value analysis committees. If you can improve patient care or you can improve the patient's outcome, that's number one. Number two, if you can make the nurse's jobs easier while improving patient care. And number three, if you can save money for the hospital, if you can re reduce the cost of caring for those types of patients with your product or technology, if you do those three things, that's a home run for me. And, and that's what we did. And, and, and I want to say that I was, you know, I was honored and blessed to be able to do that. Um, if you are able to do those three things, I'm rooting for you because I want you to be successful. That's what the hospital's overall goals are. And I'll finish with what's your value proposition, right? These are questions that you, you need to answer if you haven't already. Um, what problem do you solve? It's not so much about what your product is all about. It's what, what's the problem you're solving? Second question is how are hospitals handling this problem now? Who's the incumbent supplier or what's, this, what's the operating procedure that they're doing right now? How does your solution improve the quality of care? How does your solution save on current cost expenditures? What's your differentiating factor? If you have competitors out there and you build a better mousetrap, what makes it different? I mean, who are your competitors? Do you know who they are? These are questions that I think you may already know the answers to those. These are the questions I'd be asking. All right, I'm happy to take on questions, but before we do, I just wanna let you know that if you want more information, this was a very high level overview. It was quick, we had 45 minutes. Um, if you wanna know more information about any of the topics that I covered, please feel free to reach out to me. If there's a topic you wanna to discuss that wasn't included on this uh, webinar, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you about what my experiences were, as I don't think you're gonna run into a, a specific situation that I already didn't already encounter myself. So I'm happy to give you some additional uh, insights. Um, I'm happy to give you a, a free two hour consultation on any of these subjects. I'm, I'm semi-retired, okay? But I am, I'm a big fan of bringing new medical technology to healthcare, improving healthcare, improving the nurse's jobs, saving money. And I'm here to support you if I can. Okay, questions. What other questions can I answer for you? Well, first of all, thanks so much, Kevin, for that, that talk here. We have a couple more in the chat. Um, so uh, it looks like Victor was saying he's familiar with the Visient um, as a producer of nursing residency programs, but not as a GPO. Um, is it is the Visient a, uh, mainly a GPO or can you speak further to that? Um, if I'm not mistaken, Visient was Med Assets and another GPO merged and, coming up with, and came up with that name. Yeah, and a lot of the GPOs have additional services they provide in addition to negotiating deep discounts from the vendors. So I'm not surprised by that. And there's been some changes uh, with some of the GPOs. There's been some mergers of GPOs. There was a lot more 10, 15 years ago. So there's been some consolidation and, and additional services as well. Yeah. 
And then the other example, or the other question, excuse me, was, can you give an example of a business relationship that went particularly well um, and why and how that happened? And then also one that was sour or <laughs> didn't go so well <laughs> and why that happened. All right. I can give you a 90 second um, version. It's West Penn Hospital and Mercy Hospital, the two burn units. Um, I called on Karen Price, the unit manager of West Penn Hospital. Um, when I got an air bed, uh, new to the country, came from the United Kingdom, called the Mediscus bed. And when I met with her, I brought out my brochure, like a rookie sales rep, I'm 25 years old. You know, you, you, you throw out your brochure and you start talking from it. And, and she stopped me, she says, oh my gosh, I love this bed. I said, how's that, how's that even possible? If we just got it in the United States. It came from the United Kingdom. And she said, you don't understand. I spent six months working in a London hospital. This was the air bed we had not the clunky one we have down the hall. I didn't know this was available. I'm going to order everything from you. Perfect, right? You, you live for sales calls like that. And after a month or so servicing West Penn's burn unit, she says, Karen says, have you been over to Mercy Hospital's burn unit? I said, ah, because I knew Burton Mercy Hospital's burn unit and West Penn burn unit were arch rivals. <laughs> I said, no, I haven't been over there. She's, oh, go see Shirley Lepore. She's the unit manager. We're best friends. We go to all burn units together. We room together. You got to go see Shirley. So she writes down her phone number and Shirley's name on a sticky notepad. So I go out to the hall and pick up a pay phone back in the days when there used to be pay phones. And I called the number and a lady answers the phone. She goes, hello, this is Shirley. Well, back then you used to have to call into the, the, um, the switchboard and ask for the unit, right? So I start talking, you know, I've got this great new airbed and she started screaming at me. Like, oh my God, what are you, an airbed salesman? And um, I literally was holding a phone out this far. She was screaming at me. And then suddenly she stops and she said, hey, wait a minute. How'd you get this phone number? What was her private back line into her office? And I said, well, Karen Price gave it to me. She said, Karen gave you my number. I said, yeah. She said, is Karen using you? I said, yeah. Said, you be in my office at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And she hung up on me. And I show up at 10 o'clock the next day, right? I get in and, and the unit manager has an office in the burn unit. So you have to hit an intercom and the secretary comes out. So can I help you? Yeah, I'm here to see Shirley the poor. I'm, here's my business card. And she starts laughing at me. This, Shirley doesn't see sales reps. So I, I think there's a mistake here. So no, she told me to be here at 10 o'clock. So I go in and, and Shirley, nice as could be. Have a seat. Thank you for coming on such short notice. Tell me all about your airbag. And I start talking a little bit about it. She says, no, 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 I don't care what you like about it. I want to know what Karen likes about it. So here's the three things that Karen raved about. She goes, that's good enough for me. If I order from you, how soon can you be here? That sales call lasted maybe seven minutes. When I left, I wasn't even back at the office 30 minutes later, and she had called and placed an order with me. That, those are the good old days. Not only that, she, she, she replaced all the other airbeds that she didn't like, used mine, and then she started telling all the other unit managers in the hospital to order from me. So next thing I know, I'm getting orders from unit managers and different nursing units in Mercy Hospital that I had never even visited yet. And I say, I know I have more airbeds in Mercy Hospital than any of my other accounts, and Shirley's the only one I made a call to. And then I got the famous call from purchasing agents saying, who are you and how'd you get in my hospital? <laughs> that's another story. But that's probably my favorite story about leveraging referrals. And I would never have gotten to Shirley if it hadn't been introduced by Karen. So that's one of the best. Okay, you asked about the worst one? Conema Hospital. I'm gonna just use their name, okay? Um, we ended up getting a contract from our competitor, the Conema, and, this, and the... Uh, uh, Central Sterile Supply. Honestly, God, she was just sabotaging everything we were trying to do. Well, we found out that her nephew worked for the competitor whose contract was canceled and her, her nephew was out of a job and she was not happy with us. Similar thing happened down in West Virginia where the sales rep for our competitor in a hospital that should not be named um, was the cousin of the purchasing agent. And he wasn't about to let us, even with our GPO contract, he wasn't going to let us take her business. So we got locked out of that for a while. We eventually got the business, 
It was after his cousin left the company that we competed against. These are things that happen. Okay. It's unfortunate. Um, but it is what it is. You live with it. I don't know if that answered your questions. <laughs> I got a million stories. If you want to hear them, we can always talk later. Any other questions? Yeah, when you go into these value analysis committee presentations, is there like kinds of evidence that you just shouldn't talk about? Like, you know, I don't know, do you give them a journal article or you tell them about your their competitors, you know, quality analysis study, or is there stuff that you should or shouldn't present as in terms of types of evidence? Well, um, I think five things that I always like to see, facts, figures, data, context, and perspective, right? I also don't believe in um, dissing your competition. I always like to say, you know, who are you using? Oh, that's a great company. And that's a very good company. We're a very good company too. That's just a level the playing field. And then really focus on what made us different, okay? Um, and, and I think stories do a better job of selling because you can relate these, these people, these are human beings that are making this clinical decision and decisions, buying decisions are kind of emotional, if you know what I mean. And they use logic to support their emotional buying decisions. If you share stories of successes that you've had with other hospitals are facing the exact same situation, here's what they were, that's third party success stories. I would heavily weigh um, your presentation on that. I would heavily weigh your presentation on what the feedback was that you got from the interviews that you conducted with each of the uh, committee members, um, because they can always get your stats and your in your specs from your website or your brochures that you leave behind. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. It looks like there's another question that came in too. Uh, do you have a strategy for researchers in the development phase to reach the back before the product is ready for sales? And is it appropriate to set up a relationship before the startup is formed? It's <laughs> a great question. <laughs> if I were to do it, if I were to do it, um, I would take it to somebody that I know or somebody that knows somebody just to ask, so this product is in development. This is what it's going to be designed to do. This is the problem it's designed to, to solve. What are your thoughts? What do you think? Um, if you, and, and you can, uh, an, an easy way to do that is to go to a trade show, whatever a local trade show is that is specific to what that product is, where that product is going to be used in the hospital. I'd go to the trade show. And just talk to some people there, whether you have a booth or not. Um, it would be better if, you, well, if you don't have the product yet, then you probably would want to talk to a few people on the side, whether it's at, you know, just ask for a, you know, 30 minutes of their time. They do a lot of speed dating these days in these, these, um, these trade associations where, you know, there's vendor booths, but there's also speed dating tables. That would be a great opportunity to have a conversation like that. And then, hey, my favorite question is, hey, if you were in my shoes, what would you tell me? What would you do next? Tell me what you would do. And they usually paint a clear picture for what they think you should be doing next. Is that helpful? Excellent. All right, so we'll go ahead and just put your email in the chat as well. So everyone can copy that down if you have additional questions um, for Kevin. And I'll also put in some information in the chat as well to keep, you know, stay tuned for more information for next month's seminar. And we hope to see everyone there. So thank you so much again, Kevin, for a great, great talk about all of this. And we really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. I know it was like drinking from a fire hose, but hey, it is what it is, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you.